listening to the Faith and Recovery Radio Show. I'm your host, Anthony Akinpora. We are in sunny Miami, which is actually cool Miami today. It's in the 50s and 60s, which I love. Some people don't love that, but uh, we're here with Alex. He's our producer, and uh, we have a really special guest on today. Uh, I just want to mention a little bit about our programming, the Faith and Recovery treatment program is part of Banyan Treatment Center. It's in Pompano Beach, Florida. It's a faith-based program integrated with clinical. So there's some clinical groups in this program, but uh, primarily it's a faith-based program. And uh, clients come in from all over the country seeking faith programming for substance abuse, also mental health disorders, that type of thing. So uh, if you or you know someone who is in need feel free to give us a call, 201-538-2754. If you need a consultation or have any questions, always feel free to call us on that number, 201-538-2754. Or you could look us up on faithandrecovery.com. That's faithandrecovery.com. Let's get to our guest here. He has a lot to say, and uh, he's an amazing guy, very interesting very interesting person and, and just has a huge heart. You could just tell by what he does out there for people in addiction and dealing with mental health disorders. Mark Astar was born and raised in the UK until the age of 21. He has been an attorney since 1994. Before entering private practice, Mark has begun his legal career as a prosecutor with the Palm Beach County State's Attorney's Office. He has served the citizens of Palm Beach County as an Assistant State Attorney from 1994 to 1999. During his career as a prosecutor, he served as the chief of two different county court divisions. Thereafter, was promoted to Felony Trial Division. He has handled thousands of cases ranging from first degree murder to capital murder, first degree misdemeanors. He has ad was admitted to the Florida Bar in 1994, and in 1995, he was admitted to practice before the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. In 2005, he was admitted to the District of Columbia Bar. He has received his Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Michigan and his Juris Doctrine from Nova Southeastern College in Law. Uh, it's just amazing some of these things that he's been involved in. He focuses on his, his drug and alcohol attorneys. That's his organization, that's his company, uh, focuses on representing and empowering individuals who are in crisis because of drug and alcohol or mental health disorders or loved ones of those who refuse to get treatment. When uh, this is the case, Mark gives counsel to help navigate through the Marchman Act process, Florida's involuntary commitment law for drug and alcohol co-occurring mental health disorders. Additionally, he provides uh, individuals who no longer are competent to make medical decisions for themselves. And he's also in his spare time, I'm going to condense this a little bit, in his spare time he is an instructor for Krav Maga, which is actually absolutely incredible. And we just realized we have the same instructor. Uh, I was involved with this years back with Rick Side, and I tell you, Krav Maga, if anybody's out there that thinks they're uh, in good shape, go try doing that for a couple hours. <laughs> because, I, I mean, I was, I've played sports football, i played college basketball, I have never been so exhausted I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Rick had to come in. I was in the locker room. He came in to see if I was all right. I couldn't catch my breath. It was, it's brutal. It is brutal, but it is very, very amazing. So um, I want to welcome him now. Here he is, Mark Astor. Welcome to the Faith and Recovery Show. Anthony, thank you very, very much for, for having me on the show. You know, I was, I was listening to you, uh, your kind words. I said, I said, are you really talking about me? I was like, wow, that sounds pretty good. I don't know who wrote that, but it could have been me. So uh, I appreciate the kind words, and thank you very much uh, for giving me the uh, the honor of, of being on your show. Thank you. So absolutely. Somebody else said that recently. We had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, and he was in studio, and, 
and he was like he was just kind of looking out the window as i was saying all this stuff with his mouth open like he couldn't believe he accomplished all these things and it's really it really you know hits home when somebody kind of shares you know we were going through life and 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 all these things are happening and there's ups and downs and we have these successes and we overcome obstacles and you know when somebody's actually sharing it and we kind of could you know think about it and just be like man that is amazing you know that's awesome so Mark, let me ask you, uh, let, we'll start off with this. What what was it that motivated you, uh, not so much to, to get to be an attorney, to go into, you know, that practice, but, but to focus on the areas of mental health and substance abuse? Because that's pretty unique to have that as a focus. So tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen? Sure, sure. Um, so I was, you know, as you mentioned, I was prosecutor for a number of years. And while the job didn't pay very well, had, I had tremendous professional satisfaction because every day I went to work, and especially when you're dealing with, uh, you know, the significant crimes like rape, robbery, and all that fun stuff, where there's a, you know, there's a family involved, it's a chance to, to really give the family closure, and that feels good. Um, but in 1999, I left, and I went and, you know, did various other things. I did some criminal defense work and worked for a couple of family business, and I, and I made a lot of money, but to be honest, I was absolutely professionally miserable. And of course, you know, that sort of affected other areas of my life, including my personal life. And uh, I had a very short-lived marriage, uh, and, I, and I really believe that sort of, you know, my lack of satisfaction as, as a professional had, you know, had a lot to do with that. Sure. Um, so I tried for many years not to practice. Um, I moved to California for several years. I took the bar exam out there twice, failed it twice, which was somewhat of a kick in the pants for me because I only studied for the Florida bar for three weeks and I had no problem passing it. So... Um, and then my father got sick, so I had to come back from California to Florida. I took the bar exam one more time just to make sure I wasn't missing anything, and I failed it a third time. And at that point, I figured, you know, i got to start listening to the universe because maybe I'm supposed to be here. Um, and anyway, my, while my father was sick, I got an opportunity to work for a company down in Miami that teaches, um, that teaches lawyers the business side of the practice, which is not something they teach us in law school, which is... Um, which is why, you know, sort of this idea that all lawyers are making tons of money is just ridiculous. Most lawyers, are, you know, are struggling to make a living, quite frankly, and it's because they don't teach us, you know, really how to, to get clients in the door and, and, you know, run a proper business. Right. Anyway, I spent a year working for that company, and what they really were was a personal growth company. And it was the first time I'd ever been ex exposed to anything like that. And I realized two very, very important things uh, in the year that I was there. Number one, that the world doesn't revolve around me. And number two that if I was going to be professionally happy, um, I would have to have a, a, a practice, a business, where I was helping other people. Yes. And all three years there, I sat down with the founder of the company, and he said to me, you know, I can see you're not happy. What's the matter? I said, look, you know, I've been a lawyer 21 years now. I think it's, it's time to finally do my own thing. And he said, okay, I'll help you. What do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I was prosecutor for a number of years. I did defense work for a number of years. So I think I'm going to go to some, you know, I'll do criminal work because that's what I know. And his response was, well, you know, that sounds good, but quite frankly, there's a lot of criminal lawyers out there. Is there anything else that might motivate you to get out of bed in the morning? And I said, well, I know this sounds odd. I said, but I noticed throughout my life, um, even, in, you know, within sort of the confines of my own family, that I was surrounded by people who, if you had addiction issues or had issues with mental illness. Right. And he said, well, why don't you, why don't you open a practice up for most people? And I said, well, can I do that? He said, I know you're going to go figure it out. Yes. Did so, I, you know, I went, I went online and I started reading about the Marchman Act and I realized, you know, there's a couple other lawyers who do that kind of work, but frankly, they weren't focused on helping people with addiction and mental illness. They just, you know, were lawyers who happened to do the Marchman Act and other stuff. Right. And um, I really felt like in order to not just do a great job, but to be the best, to, to be the best at doing this stuff, I had to focus entirely uh, my efforts on helping people who solely have either addiction and or mental illness. Yeah. I wasn't going to do any kind of personal injury or family or any of that other stuff. I was going to do focus only on those people. Right. And so um, that's what I did. That's, that's what I've been amazing. For the last that's that's amazing, and I appreciate how humble you are, and, and and your honesty too. You know, saying you know about failing the the bar and and different things, and not being really happy. Where, you know, th there's a saying that says, you know, instead of just looking to make a living, how could you make a difference? You know, in someone's life, in people's lives, and that really didn't mean anything to me when I was in the corporate world, when I was in New York City, in California. 
you know, I was all about getting promoted, making more money, having a more of a title, having a bigger staff. That's what it was all about. And, and whatever I had to do to make that happen, I would do it. You know, you're just kind of like running through people. And, you know, then you get to a point where you realize hey, that's not what it's all about. You know, it's really about making a difference and it's around, you know, something that's rewarding that you're helping people. So, well, I, I deal with them every day, people with mental health disorders and in addiction at, at Banyan Treatment Center. And, and, and you're dealing with them on a daily basis. And what a, what a, you know, what a difference it makes when you see that light bulb go off and you see that difference in that person and their eyes change and, and they start to get it. And, and they're so, what I notice is they're so uh, happy. I did, a, I did a spirituality group yesterday with our mental health clients, which is down the hall from the faith program. And I'm telling you, man, just, I remembered a couple of their names. I was kind of cheating because I had their picture and their name uh, on, on my file in my, in my hand. But, but, but one girl was like, I can't believe you remember my name. Like just something simple like that. And they're so used to having their hands, you know, somebody putting their hand in their face and and no, I don't want to hear it. And don't talk and shut up. And, and nobody wants to hear from you. When you just let them actually speak and share their minds and give them some compassion, boy, that goes a long way. And it's a beautiful thing. So I'm sure that you're interacting with a lot of people, you know, with mental health disorders and things like that, your clients and things like that. So, so Mark, what are the, what are the biggest differences between the audience that you're dealing with now, the clients that you have now versus before when you were, you know, a practicing attorney and, and the clients you were dealing with them? What's the differences there? You know, you know, typically before when I was doing criminal defense work, you know, I was sort of helping individuals who had been arrested for, you know, various crimes, uh, you know, somewhere here in Florida. And, you know, my practice now, you know, really, you know, it's interesting when people ask what I do, I don't, I don't tell them I'm a lawyer. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, when my father was alive, uh, you know, he imparted many words of wisdom uh, upon me, one of which was that he hated all the lawyers except for me. <laughs> so, so I became a little bit paranoid. But number two, the, the second reason I don't initially tell people I'm a lawyer is because it really is a small part of what we do. I mean, we, we take calls from all over the country from moms and dads who call us because they, they just need help. They're, they're calling us as a last resort, and many of them are extremely emotional. I mean, I've, I've lost count of how many crying moms I've spoken to, yeah. and they want our help to save their children. So, um, you know, I hate to say that this is more of a labor of love than it was before, but it really is. You know, it's, you know, my, my business is my passion, and, you know, and that's why we, you know, we take calls at all hours of the evening. Um, and on the weekends and on the holidays, and, and I always tell people, if I'm awake, I'll answer the phone. If I don't, it's probably because I'm asleep. Right. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, that's so true, like the way you're describing that, because when you're, when you're speaking, I'm thinking of, like, at family conferences that we have, and my phone calls are interactions in person with family members. And uh, so often when I see them, they have that same look in their eye, or even in their voice, that desperation. And it's so powerful because they're just looking for like a lifeline for, for their loved one. They're looking for anything to help them. And they're, they're kind of desperate sometimes. And it's really, it's really impactful when not only are you interacting with them, but also you're able to be in a position where you can help and provide some, some relief and help for them. It's, it's, it's really an amazing thing. But the families, what people don't realize are, you know, they may not be using a substance, they may not be drinking, but they're going through this addiction with their loved one. And sometimes, oh, yeah, sometimes it's harder for them, I think, than the person that's in active addiction themselves, because they're basically focusing a lot on self and they're numbing and medicating the pain and the, and the parent is just going through it. What do you think about that, Mark? No, it, it, you know, it, you're 100% right. You know, when, before my father died, for the, probably the two years before he passed away, um, you know, I, I was living with my parents, and I lost count how many times my mom and I either called 911 or we just put him in the car and rushed into the emergency room. And I started to notice a pattern. Um, you know, my father would be lying there in intensive care with, you know, connected to all the, the machines and bells and whistles yeah. going off, and he'd have tubes coming out of there where you could possibly have tubes coming out of and I started to notice, I looked at my brother, who's now, who's a doctor, and my sister and my mom, and I could see the stress on the face. And the first time I sat down with a family whose kid had a lengthy history of addiction, I saw, I saw the exact same look in their face. Mm -hmm. and I could see the stress. I mean, yeah. they were financially, emotionally, and physically exhausted. Yes. 
they were just they were. I mean, their their kid was suffering, but I honestly think they may have been suffering more. Yeah, quite frankly. Absolutely, they, they so, have that deer in the headlights look, and it's just it's so it's very sad, and it really motivates me to try to help them and try to you know restore the, that relationship and all that type of stuff that goes on with it. Um, we're going to need to take a quick break, Mark. We'll be right back. Uh, okay. Banyan's Faith and Recovery Radio Show. We'll be back in 30 seconds. We're here with attorney Mark Astar. We'll be right back. Are you struggling with addiction or mental health disorders? Banyan Treatment Center's Faith and Recovery Program helps people at the depths of their despair, spreading the word that recovery is possible through the power of Christ. Cry out to him. Where are you, God? Where are you? I don't feel you. Where's your presence? Why are you allowing this to happen? He already knows our thoughts anyway. We might as well just put it out there. Program Director Anthony Ancapura will help you discover how God can turn your mess into your message. Call Banyan Treatment Center for help now. 888-230-3122. Again, that's 888-230-3122. Welcome back to the Faith and Recovery Radio Show. I'm your host, Anthony Acapora. We are here with, he doesn't like to be called attorney, so I'm just going to say Mark Astar. And that's, love it. that's pretty interesting, you know. Most people, they can't wait to get that title, and it's all about, you know, the title and everything. And here he, here he is an attorney practicing, and he, he'd rather just be focusing on, you know, what do you, what you call it, a labor of love, uh, Mark? Is that what it was? Yeah, it really, it really is. I've been called an attorney with heart. I, I think uh, that's uh, nice. Uh, maybe that's good. Just as good. That's awesome. Uh, that I tell you that that's uh, I I don't think I've ever heard that before. So so that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, you could tell. Like I said on the opening, you have a you have a heart for people, and uh, sometimes that gets developed through a lot of pain. You know, whether it's us going through it or our loved ones going through it, and family members like like yourself and people that you know that you know we're talking about that look on their face and that desperation and that pain and it, it has an impact on you you know and and i never had a compassion to be honest for people that had addiction or mental health disorders or any of that stuff till i went through a lot of the stuff myself and you develop a compassion for people that are suffering with things that are very similar or the same thing that you've gone through or people that you've known have gone through. So uh, one of the reasons, you know, I get asked the question all the time, why does God allow suffering? Oh, well, there's one of your reasons because you go through it, you learn about it, you overcome it, you develop a compassion for that issue, and then you go and help other people get through it and overcome it themselves. So Mark, we're glad to have you. We're back with him now. And uh, Mark, let me ask you a little bit about the, the criminal justice system in, sure. in general, the laws with what's going on here with fentanyl and car fentanyl and all this other stuff that's happening, the, the overdoses over and over. It's just been such an, uh, a national issue. What do you, do you foresee anything changing? What do you think needs to change, you know, as far as from a criminal justice legislation, uh, you know, the laws are concerned? What do you think about that? Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're a little bit blessed here in Palm Beach County and that we have, you know, we have a great state attorney here in David Ehrenberg who has really, yes. you know, yes. with, with the Sober Homes Task Force, which is actually led by a former colleague of mine, Al Johnson, they've done a great job of cleaning up the industry here. So I think that sort of the, the whole sort of stigma, as it were, that Florida is a horrible place to come for treatment is no longer true. I mean, the bad actors have either been arrested or they've gone out of business because they were cheating and now they can't cheat anymore, so they can't get clients. So what you're left, left with is a, is a really, in my opinion, a great collection of of, uh, of of treatment providers. So you know we've got that going on, but they're also from. I, I think we've, well, there's a couple of things. I think number one, we need to stiffen the penalties. And I think there's, I think that's already happened for people who get caught with you know things like fentanyl and and heroin. So I mean, you know, it, it, you know, it used to be you got caught, you know, caught selling a little crack, and you were a first time offender. It was sort of. You know, when I was prosecuted back in the 90s, it was 90 days in the county jail and have a nice day. Right. You know, possibly those people, you got, I mean, I hate to say it, you got to send them to prison. You got to get them off the street, one, because they, otherwise they won't learn. And number two, because every time they sell, a, you know, some type of drug, and the drugs today, as you know, are laced with fentanyl, which is, you know, basically a tranquilizer and it's deadly. Yeah. Uh, if you don't get them off the street, you, you risk there's, there's they're going to sell a hot dose to somebody and get somebody killed. So I, I think, you know, definitely we've got to increase the penalties. The third thing is, and I know it's my favorite subject, which is the Marchman Act, mm -hmm. is that you know we we make we need we should be making better use of the Marchman Act. And when I say that, what I mean is we need to stop the revolving door of the emergency room. So 
the Monster Act, although I use it to, to basically get a court order, for lack of a better word, it can actually be used a bit like a Baker Act, which means that law enforcement or even a doctor in the emergency room could initiate a 72-hour hold for someone who's overdosed. But we don't do it down here because we just don't have the facilities to put people in. And so they go into the emergency room, they go back out, they overdose in the parking lot, they go right back in. So, right. you know, I, I mean, I, I think we have some, some good structures in place. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, there's work, there's work to be done. Yeah. So, and I know they are working on it here in Palm Beach County. We've got John Hewlett down here, who was uh, governor, New Jersey governor Chris Christie's drug czar. He's now the Palm Beach County drug czar. I've met with him. He's a terrific guy. He has a, a daughter who's in recovery. So he really gets it, and he's really working hard to try and, yeah. you know, fix things. He's a terrific, terrific guy, and he really cares. So we're moving in the right direction, but you know as well as I do. I mean, we're, we're in a crisis here, and it's not just Florida or Palm Beach County. It's nationwide. Yeah. We're losing, yeah. We're losing a whole generation of, of young people to, to, to this disease. So Absolutely. We're moving in the right direction, but a lot of work to be done. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And Chris, speaking of Chris Christie, I just did a group this morning, and I, and I played his video. If you put in Chris Christie addiction, it is powerful. It's about a seven-minute video of him speaking about a, his best friend that was lost to addiction. It is powerful. So, um, but I, I want to just mention, like, what you were saying about with uh, the revolving door and the emergency rooms. I had... Dr. Keith Ablo on a couple of months ago, and he was talking about that, and he's a psychiatrist in, in the Massachusetts area, and he's on Fox News and stuff all the time commenting on mental health issues and things. But he said, he said he'll send someone to the ER who is saying that they, they want to kill themselves, and then they'll, they'll get down there and he'll get a call back from somebody and they'll say, well, you know, he's not saying that now. He's saying he wants to go home, so we're going to let him go home. And he, and he goes, well, it's only been 45 minutes. He just said he wanted to kill himself. That's what he was saying to me. So, you know, you have these emergency rooms that are overwhelmed, and they, they, they don't really want to, you know, um, take someone in, admit someone. So they're looking for kind of a way out. And then when they get in there, they're pushing them out the door, you know, by, by you know, and maybe they're not ready to leave, and they're not really ready to go out. But th the system is so broken that it's almost designed to fail and then you have these people going into the emergency room over and over for depression for for whatever and you know um it's really because they didn't have a fair chance to get better in the first place like i never understood that if it takes three or four weeks for a medication to kick in and you're letting somebody out in three or four days how would you know if it has an, an adverse side effect if it works if it doesn't work you wouldn't even know. So it's set up to fail. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know. What yeah. do you think? What do you think, Mark? Well, no, I, I agree. I know when I used to go to the emergency with my father, I mean, they'd be, yeah, they would, there'd be so many people in there who were dealing with these issues. They'd have them lined up on, like, gurneys, but in the hallway. They didn't have enough rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here's my father coming in to see, you know, he had a small stroke and, you know, was incapacitated, and there's people lying on a gurney, and, you know, you can see what it is. You know what it is. It, means it becomes clear that they have, because they probably used it. They've overdosed or... If they've come in with law enforcement because they threaten to hurt themselves or somebody else. Right. I mean, we've, we've taught, we've really, I hate to say it, but we're turning our emergency rooms into drug addiction and mental health facilities, which is not what they're there for. Exactly. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, Mark, I, we're going to, we're going to get ready to close here. I wish we had more time, but I want to give you time to get information sure. out about what you're doing and how to connect with you and how to follow you. Cause it's great. It's really great stuff what you're doing. So, uh, Take it away there as far as what you're doing there, Mark. Great. Well, so look, if, if anybody's out there and, um, you know, they they know somebody who's in crisis, a, a mom or a dad, or occasionally it's, a, you know, a brother or a sister or a spouse, you can reach out to us. Uh, we can be found on the web, drugandalcoholattorneys.com. You can email me at mark, with a K, at drugandalcoholattorneys.com. You can call me, 561-419-6095. Uh, there's a drug and alcohol attorneys page on Facebook. There's Mark G. Astor on Facebook, which is my personal page, but it's open to the public. We're on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And every week I do a podcast too. So nice. they, they come to the website on a Friday after five. They can, we, we, I normally have a great guest and we talk about you know some of these really uh, cool issues that you and I That's have chatting about. 
I, yeah, I watched it a couple of times. It's really interesting. If, you know, whoever's listening out there, check that out and follow Mark and get in touch with him. He's doing great work out there. It's from the heart, and, and you don't find that too often. I mean, I don't want to bash attorneys, but, you know, that that's amazing <laughs> what you're Thank doing. You. So yeah, um, we're going to need to end. Thank you so much for coming on, Mark. If you or someone you know is in need of treatment, substance abuse, or inpatient uh, give us a call, 201-538-2754, or you could uh, reach us on our website at faithinrecovery.com, faithinrecovery.com. Mark, thank you so much. I wish you all the best, and I'll be talking to you soon. Uh, you God so bless you thank all you. out there. Thank you, and uh, everybody be safe out there. And I'd like to end with Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. Thank you for listening. God bless. Thanks, Anthony.